So we've only got an hour together. As many people have said, this room is slightly cold, although the, uh, the people are turning up the heating on that, so it's going to get a little bit better. This is going to be an interactive session. So if an idea of a vaguely interactive session is your idea of hell, now now's the time to kind of get up and sneak out the door, and that will be totally fine. But part of it's interactive because it's also post-lunch, right? So part of you is going, I just want to have a little snooze right now, okay? So I'm going to make sure that you don't fall asleep. Here's the first thing I'd like you to do. I'd like you just to turn to a person next to you, and I'd like you to have this quick conversation. What's been the most important insight you've taken away from the conference so far? You've been here for a day or a day and a half. What's the key learning, the key insight that you've taken so far? So turn to a person next to you. Have that quick conversation now, please. Good. Here's what I'd like you to do quickly before you do the next thing. Just tell the person you've been talking to your name because they've already forgotten it, okay? So tell each other your name, remind them of that. Perfect. <laughs> now, now you're going to need to get to talk to somebody you've not yet talked to. So this involves standing up, please. So everybody stand up quickly. Stand up quickly. Go find somebody nearby that you've not yet said hello to. Say hello to them. I'll tell you what happens next, okay? Let me have your attention briefly. Slightly different questions so far, related but different. You've talked about the key insight you've taken away so far. Here's the next question. What's the one action you're definitely going to take as a result of being at, being at this conference? What's the one action you're definitely going to take? A couple of minutes. Let's say the person with the longest hair goes first, OK? Have that conversation now. <laughs> Brilliant. Lovely, lovely. Tell your new friend your name again so they remember it. Lovely, good, okay. One third final rotation. Go find somebody else new in the room you haven't spoken to. Find a new partner, please. Find a new partner. This is kind of like a really hot dating scene, but kind of different, okay? Here's the conversation now. Now, what we're talking about here, why you're hearing what you want to talk about is actually talking about coaching. Now, there's a problem with that which is everybody kind of knows what we're talking about with coaching, but everybody's a bit kind of fuzzy about the details, right? It's like I sort of know it when I see it. I'm going to figure out what we already know about coaching here so I don't repeat myself. So here's what's going to happen. Five-minute conversation, okay? In that five minutes, and it's an intense one, I want you to talk with your partner about a time when you were coached well by somebody, by a boss, by a colleague, by a random person on the street, by a sporting person, whatever it is, but find a time in your past where somebody actually didn't do a kind of sucky, underwhelming, ho-hum moment of coaching, but actually did something that made a difference, okay? As you tell that story, here's what you've got to do. You've got to come up between the two of you with five things that your coaches did that actually made this good coaching rather than ho-hum, boring coaching, okay? So this is fairly intense, five minutes. Tell a couple of quick stories and figure out five things coaches do when they're doing it well. Have that conversation now, please. Perfect. Good, good, good. So let's just do this quickly, and then I can let you go back to your original seats. Let's hear some of the elements of what makes up good coaching. We'll do it fast. Who jump in for me? Questions. Good questions. Fantastic. What else? Listening. Good listening. Excellent. What else? Drawing out solutions rather than dumping them on them. I love that. Good. What else? Yeah. Observation. Good, good. What else? Empowerment and feelings or empowerment of feelings. That's all good. Anything else? Feeling understood. The coach or the person being coached? The co Perfect. The coach understood what I was saying, so a degree of empathy and connection around that. Love that. Good. What else? Good. Relevant support, maybe some big picture stuff that they may not have seen. That's all great. What else? Building confidence, fantastic. It feels like you've got somebody on your side, right, rather than kind of beating you up or um, it's me versus you. It's like you're actually with me. Good. What else? Reflective feedback, excellent. I like that. I'm not even sure what that is, but I'm sure it's awesome. <laughs> fantastic. Good. What else? Being genuine, right. You totally know, right, when somebody's actually with you and actually real rather than them like, I'm faking this. Right? This is fake empathy. Good. What else? Say it again. Understanding the context, good. And there was somebody over here? Patience, I love that, good. And over here? Helping you to think outside the box. This is fantastic, yeah, that's great. Brilliant, information and bite size, so you're not overwhelmed by a content dump. Good, one or two final comments if you've got it. 
gaining commitment, gaining engagement, lovely. Anything else? Love that. Helping to clarify the real issues. We spend so much time in our workplaces solving the wrong problems, don't we? So helping with that. Fantastic. Grab a seat, please. Okay, and we'll talk a bit more about this. So here's the thing. When I go into organizations and I ask the people I'm working with, so tell me about what you understand by coaching, they come up with an almost identical list that you do. So the problem with getting coaching to stick in our organizations and to work in our organizations and to flourish in our organizations isn't a lack of understanding about what coaching is. Everybody gets that. You know, in five minutes, actually it's only four minutes. In four minutes, you've distilled the essence of a brilliant coach just like that. So there are other things that get in the way of why coaching doesn't flourish in our organization. So I'm going to give you a few distinctions that I think might be helpful and might help you understand how if getting coaching going and flourishing in your organization is important, you'll be able to take back, and I think you'll find these useful. Here's the first one, just to set the stage. It's the difference between coaching for performance and coaching for development. Now, this is a bit kind of coaching jargon. Does anybody have a sense of what this is, coaching for performance? Any idea what that I'm talking about there? So here's what, yeah, please. Exactly. It's like, let's fix, let's fix this. Something's gone wrong, we need to sort it out. Okay? That's coaching for performance. It's what most organizations spend most of their time thinking about when they're talking about coaching. And then coaching for development, what do you reckon that's about? Right. So that's actually the focus on helping people uh, achieve their potential. So you've summarized that perfectly. Here's what I'd say. In most organizations, when they talk about coaching, Really what they're talking about is coaching for performance because in many ways they're going, we just need to keep getting things sorted. Coaching is the new buzzword, so let's just slap that on, the same old coaching pr management principles of me telling you what to do, right? So instead of me going, do this, you go, have you thought about doing this? As if making it a question stops it being advice. It's still the same old advice, okay? Coaching for development, where that ends up is in the ghetto of performance appraisals, right? Every year we'll have a conversation about who do you want to be, where you grow up, what are the next three years like, and then you go, awesome. We don't have to talk about this for another 364 days. I'll see you in a year's time, okay? <laughs> There's my coaching for perform development done. So most of the focus is on coaching for performance, and that is important. I personally think that if you're a good coach or an adequate coach, you can actually see that there are always seeds for this conversation that exist in this conversation. And I think that's one of the key insights around how to make coaching have more impact, is understand that good managers and leaders get into that conversation more often. And in fact, I would bet that when you talked about your good experience of being coached, my bet is for the majority of you, you're talking about a conversation over here rather than a conversation over here, because those are the conversations that really stick. So, I spent many years training coaching programs in organizations and being frustrated because I went, however good this course is, when they leave the room, it doesn't seem to translate into reality. Right? They go back with the best of intentions and within two days, they're swept back into the same old habits, the same old patterns of managing and behaving in the same way. So we started thinking about coaching from this perspective, asking this question, why do managers resist coaching? And we did some research and we talked about it, and there are a few reasons why managers resist coaching. The first one, it's obvious, it's the first one that occurred to you too, probably. They don't have enough time. They're just too busy. Here's the second thing. They feel a bit inadequate about this whole coaching thing. They're like, look, I'm a normal person. I'm not a touchy-feely, HRE, huggy, pastel colors, Muzak type of person. I just want to get on with the business. I don't want to do that other stuff. Okay, so they're a bit weirded out about the whole coaching thing. And then there's part of them that also says, look, I don't even know if I have the capacity to be a really good coach. I'm not sure I can rise to that challenge. So we say a few things to try and address that. Things like, we're not training you to be an excellent coach. We want you to be an adequate coach. Like, I am an excellent coach, and I've spent thousands of pounds and thousands of hours trying to become so, I am over-engineered for most solutions in organizations. You don't need to be an excellent coach. You just need to be an adequate coach. But fundamentally, when we're working with managers and leaders, we say this is what you need to understand to be a more effective coach. Three principles. And I think you're going to like these. Be lazy, be curious, and be often. Be lazy, be curious, and be often. Now, what do you think I'm talking about here? What do you think I mean by 
be lazy. Why is that useful? Yeah. Exactly. So managers and leaders love to jump into solution mode. Let me take this on. Let me fix this. Let me give you the answer. And there's a reason for that, because they've been rewarded and encouraged to do that for years. But there's a price everybody pays for that. One is the manager already feels like I've got too much of my own work to do without trying to fix all your lives for you. And secondly, the person who they're coaching or working with doesn't get the chance to figure the stuff out themselves. So everybody, the organization, the person being coached, and the manager pay a price when the manager is not being lazy. Secondly, being curious, that's pretty obvious, right? Most managers, most leaders are advice-giving maniacs, right? They're machines. They love it, right? They don't even know what the problem is, but they know what the answer is, right? And so part of what we're trying to do is this shift around a little less advice, a little more questions. Now, what we're not saying here is that coaching is this miraculous silver bullet that will save the day and everybody should abandon everything they know about being a good manager and just start coaching. That's ridiculous. But what we're saying is that coaching, this ability to ask good questions, this ability to be curious, is a well underdeveloped skill and tool for most managers. And if they add it into their toolkit, they'll have more impact, they'll work less hard, they'll have a more self-sufficient team, it can really make a difference. And what do you think the third principle is about? Be often. Do it frequently. Exactly. So the metaphor I use is the difference between a flash flood and drip irrigation. Right? In many organizations, coaching gets pinched as this flash flood event. Every month, we're going to sit down and we're going to have this coaching conversation. Okay? So the manager is a bit uptight because they're like, normally I just manage people, but now I have to coach them. And I can't really remember very much from this coaching program I went on except to do active listening. Right? So I know with active listening, all I have to do is nod my head a lot and make small grunting noises of encouragement. Right? So they're going, mm, 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 this is good, I'm coaching. And part of them in their head is going, what the hell's going on here? Right? Meantime, the person they're coaching is going, why are you acting so weird? Okay? Why can't we just have a normal conversation around here? And after the half hour, hour coaching conversation, they all go, well, thank God that's over. I'll see you again in a month because apparently we now have to do this. Okay? Whereas for me, I go, look, far more effective is five minutes or ten minutes as often as you can because it's little tips of the tiller. It's little pushes every now and then that's going to create focus, that's going to create behavior change, that's going to make a difference in the way that you manage and the way that you lead people. So be lazy, be curious, be often. You've got a question. Yes. And there is a very sense of lifespan of the experience that is not possible for the professional manager. True. I think that's the sure. So that, I think that's absolutely right. We don't have time to get into it in much detail there, but one of the things you've just got to address is that the power thing, which is I'm trying to coach you, but I'm also I make judgments about your success or not about your success. But what I think I find from many organisations is increasingly. They're looking at their managers and they go, in addition to all the other stuff you're doing, you now need to be coaching the people that you're working with. So that is the context for this conversation in particular. And I think you're right that if you have the luxury of kind of cross-fertilizing around that, it's an interesting avenue to explore for sure. Good. So, got those three principles. How do we get into those? I say to make things as simple as possible, because that allows managers to actually get into this coaching piece, simple as possible. Three key coaching moments. There are only three key coaching moments that you need to look out for. And here they are. The first is, how do I help you get clear on what the challenge is? Because as we've already said, in too many organizations, we're coming up with brilliant solutions to the wrong problems. Right? So a bit of time and effort to actually figure out how do you get clear on the real challenge is an extraordinarily powerful investment. And what's amazing is that often that's all you need to do. Because as soon as they know what the real challenge is, they know what to do from there. They don't need any more support or encouragement. They just need to get clear on where should I be really focusing. So that's the first one. The green card coaching. Well, the, is, the second piece is creating possibilities. How, if you know what the challenge is, do you quickly generate new ideas, new possibilities, new ways of approaching it? And we're going to practice that. You can see the green cards are on your table. We're actually going to get into that and you're going to experience that. Okay, somebody's got their head in their hands already. Okay, no problem. Hang in there up the back. 
And the final one is this, actually, how do you get things going? How do you spark action? So it's okay to have an idea of what the key challenge is. It's another thing to have good ideas, but unless you do something with it, so what? Okay? So clarity on the challenge, creating possibilities, and how do you spark action? So let's bring this alive. Oh, yeah, just to say we're, at, we're, we're actually on the exhibition floor. If you want to come and talk to us more about that, 284, me and Gary are down there. We'll have that conversation. So, cool. Let's talk about creating possibilities. Like I say, this is the interactive bit. You're actually going to do a little bit of coaching. I'm going to show you how this works. What I'd like you to do is find somebody new in the room to work with, okay? That way you don't have to face the person later going, oh, it's a nightmare. This is embarrassing. What are we going to talk about? So, do me a favor. This is the last time I'll ask you to do this. Get up, find somebody new, sit down when you're ready to go, but bring a green card with you, okay? Make sure you got one of those green cards. Thanks for doing that so quickly. That's fantastic. Brilliant. And it looks like we've got the right numbers in the room. It's a miracle. OK, give me your attention for a sec. We've got about 25 minutes left, so we're going to have to do this quickly, all right? Here's the, here is the problem we're trying to get a solution to. Nothing is more dangerous than an idea when it's the only one you've got, right? And you know this happens in organizations all the time. You're sitting down, you've got a challenge, and somebody goes, eh, we could do this, I guess. And because the idea isn't too scary, isn't too weird, and you can do it, everybody goes, well, thank God, let's just do that then, okay? Discussion over action plans, okay? Let's move into mo motion around this. And there's real value in just pausing for a moment and going, how do we quickly expand the range of possibilities we have on the table? Because if we can do that, then we're going to have some better options in which to actually decide what will we end up doing? What will we choose to do? So this is a very quick way to generate new ideas and new possibilities. What you don't know is part of my background is working in the world of innovation and creativity. I spent 10 years or so doing nothing but running brainstorms and helping companies invent new products and services. I am, in fact, partially responsible for the invention of Pizza Hut stuffed crust pizza. The, I know, exactly. Well, it's the moment of that going, if this is the peak of my career, I'm going to be really depressed, right? I do not want to die going, yeah, in his 20s, he helped invent a pizza, right? That's what got me into this field. But a lot of what I'm taking from here is like, how do you take the best practices of creativity and innovation, that's why I'm part of the creativity stream, and make it really work here. So here's what we need to do. Oh, actually, let me show you on the card. Take a look at the green card for me. And what you're going to see here is two sides on it. On one side, it says, create possibilities. And this is the five-step process to help you generate new ideas quickly. First of all, recognizing the coaching moment, as in saying, would it be useful if we had some ideas? They'll say, yes, you're right, fantastic. Secondly, decant your current ideas. Thirdly, how to generate new ideas quickly. Fourthly, how to make a choice. And fifthly, then how to amp things up. And then we're going to get into all of those steps in the 25 minutes or so we've got left. On the other side, you see my 10 most powerful creative questions. So you'll be able to take these away and use these and practice when we're done with this session, and you'll be practicing them with me right now. Now, to make this work, you need to have something that you need to have some ideas about. So you're going to have a three-minute conversation with your partner. In that three minutes, you need to tell your partner something that you'd like to have some new ideas about. Okay? It can be a personal thing, holiday options, or how to deal with my bad teenage child. It can be a work thing. I've got this project. I've got this challenge. It can be a people thing. I've got this struggle with this person I'm managing. It can be a product thing. I'm trying to launch this or sell this. Whatever it is for you, something that you go, you know what? This would be just fun to have some new ideas about. Have a quick conversation with your partner. Tell him about it so he or she knows what you're trying to do. Three minutes. Do your best. Have a go now. Great. Hands up if you're pretty clear what your partner wants to have some good ideas about. Everybody clear on that? Excellent. If you don't know, just fake it for me, okay? Perfect. Right. So, 
we're going to do a little bit of coaching. You're both going to get a practice coaching and being coached. The person with the largest feet is going to be the coach to start off. The person with the more petite feet is about to be coached. So figure that out now. Who's playing what role? Yes. Uh, biggest feet is about to be coached. Smaller feet is about to do the coaching. Perfect. Good. So now you have a little bit more information about that person than you really wanted, but never mind. Hang in there. Okay. So the first step to doing some work here is you have to, well, starting to drink heavily always helps, but actually there's a metaphor here. You have to decant the ideas that are already in their head before you can have new ideas. So this is the first step. And this is what it sounds like, okay? So coaches, I'm talking to you. You're going to have 90 seconds to do this little part of the coaching, and it's really easy, okay? Here's how it sounds. You go, look, I understand your challenge, and I'm sure you've already got some ideas about how to tackle it. So what's the first idea you've already got? And they will tell you something, and what you will do is you will look interested. You will nod your head, and you'll go, fantastic, I like it, good, 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 okay? You don't need to comment on it or build on it or do anything. You just go, great, fantastic. And then you go, and this is, by the way, the most powerful coaching question in the world. You ask this question. And what else? What else? What other idea do you have? And they'll go, oh, okay, and they'll give you another idea, and you'll look equally interested and amazed and fascinated by their idea. And then you'll go, fantastic, I bet you there's another idea. What's another idea you've got? And at this stage, they'll like, start hating you because they're working so hard, but you don't mind. You just go, fantastic, and you'll ask them, and what else? And you're going to do this for 90 seconds, and you're going to see how it goes, okay? And at a certain point, they may go, I have nothing left, which is fine. We'll deal with that the next step, okay? So just 90 seconds. All you're doing is, I know what your challenge is. What's your first idea? And what else? And what else? And what else? But in a kind of genuine, caring, I'm actually curious sort of way, okay? And you can see here how you're being lazy, and you're being curious, and you're being off and all at once, okay? So 90 seconds, it may even be shorter than that. Take it away, let's see how it goes. Brilliant, brilliant, good stuff. Okay, before we swap over, before we swap roles, quick debrief. Coaches, the people who are doing mmm and what else, what was that experience like for you? What did it feel like to do that for 90 seconds or so? It's easy, right? <laughs> did you not sit here going, this is awesome? I'm barely working at all, and look how hard they're working. Fantastic, right? I want that. I want you to be lazy. I want you to stop working so hard. Not just so you don't work so hard. So they do work, and so they actually get into it and actually try and solve the problem themselves. Good. What else was it like being the coach there? Did anybody feel the urge to go, oh, I've got some good ideas, I really want to offer them up? I bet you you did, right? So some of you, you're like, I'm this solution-giving machine. I must tell you my ideas, OK? You don't even know what their problem is. You don't know this person, but you know how to fix their problem, right? That is the same for all your managers, OK? They're all trained trigger hair to jump in with solutions. And one of the key things we're trying to do here is just delay the rush to advice, delay the rush to solutions. And that's why and what else is such a powerful question. Not just because the first thing somebody has to say is never the only thing they've got to say, but it's a self-management tool to stop you jumping in and screwing it up by trying to contribute and add value, okay? You're adding value by asking good questions. The people being coached, what was it like to have this person, even though you knew what they were doing, what was it like to have this person kind of looking enthusiastic and being a bobblehead doll and going, mm, and what else? Right? What was that like? Good, fantastic. <laughs> but I mean, you wanted to do that before he started asking questions. Yeah. Good. And why did you want to kill him? Thank you. Right. So making you do the work, definitely. What else? What else was it like? Perfect. So it's actually impactful, right? So here's the thing to take away from this quick exercise before we swap roles. If any of you have ever involved in corporate brainstorms, you will know that the corporate brainstorm is quite possibly the worst meeting ever to attend, right? Because what happens is for an hour or two hours, you take these few ideas that you've already have, 
and you slowly stomp them to death, okay? It's awful, right? So the, you can scale this process up to corporate brainstorm facilitation, where you go, let's get the ideas you've already got out fast, and then we can get onto some new ideas. So this speed of decanting the ideas is part of the process. Good, you know what's going to happen? Swap roles. Coachy, it's now your time to get rig your revenge, look interested, and go, good, and what else? Other person, let's see what ideas you've got. 90 seconds or so, take it away. I know some of you are going, saved by the bell, right? Thank goodness, All right, good. Any comments, any final reflections or comments on that easy, quick step about decanting the ideas? Anything you notice, anything you want to say? You came up with ideas you never thought of. And how long did I give you to do this? So far, you have spent less than three minutes coaching, right? A minute and a half, basically, to define your challenge. About a minute and a half, actually, I gave you less, to actually get the ideas out on the table. And so in less than three minutes, for some of you, you've already made more coaching progress in your coaching than normally it takes you 45 minutes to do. So part of this is seeing the speed in which you can coach if you're focused, if you have a process, if you have a few good questions. Good, so you've decanted the ideas that are already there. Sometimes the person you're working with goes, I didn't even know I had all these ideas. This is awesome. I know exactly what I want to do. My work here is done. And you're like, fantastic, get out of my office, because I have other things to do, right? And you're like, awesome, three minutes, and I got them out of my office, woo, right? But sometimes I go, well, this is good, yeah. What if you don't have any ideas? Good, so let me ask you this. What if you say, what ideas do you already have? And they go, I've got nothing. So how would you handle that? What do you, what do you reckon? What are some ideas? Yeah, fantastic. So what's going through your head? That's not bad. Sometimes, say that's right. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're not allowed to drink or eat until you come up with an idea. How's that going to work? It's like, in three minutes, I'm going to chop off a finger. Does that help you concentrate? Good. Love that. That's possible. What else could you do? Yeah. Love that. If you did have an idea, what would you be? Or another a variation on that, what's your best guess then? Take a guess, right? Because that kind of diminishes the risk around that. That's fantastic. Anything else you could do? Yeah. Oh, nice. How would Superman solve it? That, sometimes that can make it worse for people. Sometimes they can, <laughs> they're like, I have no idea. Do I look like I wear my underwear outside my trousers, right? Sometimes it helps, though. Sometimes it gives them a different perspective. Yeah, love that. Go away and think about it and come back a little later and come back with at least two or three ideas. Did you notice how I answered that question, by the way? I, yeah, I just went, I, that's a good question, isn't it? What do you reckon? And you guys answered it for me. Lazy coach, lazy facilitator. Who's doing the work? You are. How much more credible are the answers because you came up with them? Much more credible. What I do at the end is I just say something to make sure that you know that I'm the real expert, okay? But mainly you're doing the work. So a really great little takeaway, when somebody asks you a question, you say this. That's a really good question, and I've got some good ideas, but I'm curious, what, what are the first ideas that you've got? And watch them do the work, okay? Nice little way of working there, yeah. Yes. Yes, that's true. Thank you for providing the perfect segue to the next session. Perfect, I love that. <laughs> that is awesome. What I, anybody see my clicker? There's my clicker. Good. Because you've got to this point and you're like, okay, you've got a range of ideas, and in your head you say almost all of these are absolutely idiotic. Okay? Uh, if you do any of these, this is going to be a career limiting move. Okay? So, what you need to do is help them generate new ideas and new possibilities. So I'm going to give you some key principles about this next step. We'll do this quickly because I'm definitely running out of time. Here we go. Principle number one, the use of powerful provocative questions. You can see those listed on the back of your card. You can take those away with you. That's going to be helpful. Number two, five is the charm. Here is how your unconscious brain counts. One, two, three, four, lots. It's why you can remember the names of people in four people bands, but not in five people bands. Because at a certain point, your brain just goes, there's a lot of stuff out there. So if you can get to five new ideas, the person's going to feel unstuck, because they feel, I've got lots of options. So five is a good number to aim for. And the next one, and you can see me doing this with you right now, the value of picking up the pace. 
keep things moving. One of the things that kills idea conversations is they go too slowly. So I say to people, I tell you what, let's do this. Let's have 12 new ideas in the next three minutes. Now, what's your reaction when I say that, if I said that to you? 12 ideas in the next three minutes. Yeah, part of you is like, oh my God, I can't do that. Let me show you what 12 ideas in the next three minutes sounds like, okay? I think we should recarpet this room. I think we should change the light bulbs in here. Now, if you keep up that rapid pace of ideation, <laughs> you too will get 12 ideas in three minutes, OK? So it's less scary than you think, particularly when you've got some awesome questions to help you have new ideas, OK? So here's what you're going to do. In the same order, oh, and here's a way, and this will partly answer your question about what if they've got insane ideas. There's an option for you to start slipping your ideas into the mix. So you do get to contribute. Here's the phrase you want to use, OK? It's a great phrase. That makes me think of. So when they say something, you build on it by saying, that makes me think of. And it provides a bridge that stops your idea being the big one or overwhelming or the obvious one, just part of the mix. So that makes me think of a good way to get your advice or possibilities into the mix. Good. So here's what you're going to do. The same order you did it before. Take a look at your card, please. And you're going to spend two minutes coaching your partner. Same person's kicking us off, the person with the enormous feet. OK? Here's what the question you're going to start with. You're going to start with the, one of the top two questions there. What's the obvious thing to do? Or what's the easiest thing to do? You can pick. Here's what you're not going to do. You're not then going to rush onto another question, but you are, in fact, going to use the best coaching question in the world, which is, and what else? Fantastic. So it sounds like this. So what's the obvious thing to do? And what else would be obvious to do? And if there was another obvious thing to do, what would that be? And after you've kind of worn that one out a little bit, I'd like you to pick any one of these other questions on the card, entirely up to you, and try that out. And throw in a, bit, a few more, and what else's? See how that goes. It's only two minutes because we're running out of time, but you'll get a good sense of this. Two minutes, your time starts now. Take it away. <laughs> Perfect. Good, good, good. <laughs> Step number one, please. Thank your partner for their awesome coaching. Brilliant. So let me ask, any quick comments, any quick reflections on what that was like? What did you notice? It was good? Fantastic. What was good about it? Perfect. So I love that. So there's a lightness, there's a fun to it, but there's also a pace to it. Like, so grand total of coaching, four and a half minutes so far. Right? Quite a lot of progress in four and a half minutes, right? In terms of, particularly as just a person you don't even know, right? So good. What else? Any other comments or reflections? Yes. I love that. Great insight. So that is exactly why I remain in a permanent state of ignorance about almost everything, right? Because it allows me to be better coach. The more you know, the more tempting it is to jump in and be the solution provider. So it's a great in insight about self-management, for sure. Good. Let me take you to the final step we're going to cover today on this, which is making a choice. I'm going to take you through these three questions right now. So you've come up with possibilities for the challenge you set yourself. Here's the first question to ask. Of all those ideas you've had, what's the easiest thing to do? Get that idea in your head or write it down if you want. Second question to ask, of all these ideas you've had, what would have the most impact? What would make the most difference? Write that down if you want or uh, get the idea in your head. Thirdly, of all those ideas you had, what do you want to do? Because that's where your energy is, that's where your passion is, that's where you're kind of drawn to. And what we're doing here is we're creating a nice short list. A short list, the easiest things like the minimum thing that you're going to take on, the most impact is often the boldest thing that you might do. This just tells you where your heart is, where your inclination is. It's always easier to do the things you want to do than don't want to do. And it sets you up for the final question in this step, which is, so knowing all of that, what will you do? What's the action you will take? And you may even notice this in yourself. 
something shifts when you ask that question because it gets a little bit more serious and a little more focused and it, it's a question of commitment at this stage. So in this opportunity, you get a chance to people narrow stuff down. This is the rhythm of creativity. You diverge and then you converge. If all you do is diverge, you're left with a whole bunch of half-baked ideas. You must go out, but you must come in. And these four questions are great ways to actually provide some focus to what's going on. Now, I've run out of time to talk about the amp up piece, but I will just say that people tend to have an opportunity to come back to the choice they've made and deepen it and make it stronger and more powerful. And you can do that by just reusing the same questions on the back of your card. Things like, okay, so you've chosen this, so tell me, what's the easiest way of implementing this? And what else? And what else? And what's the fastest way of implementing it? And what else? And what else? And what's the boldest way of implementing it? Good, so knowing that, how will you implement it? And you just go through that same process again to deepen and strengthen the idea. Yeah? Yes, it's just a slightly different starting point, but you go through that same basic process. Okay, so here we are. We've covered the steps of the, the, the program, the, the, the card, and here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping you've got this little flame of excitement about coaching and 10-minute coaching and creativity and what's possible. And here's what I know that in two days' time, the cold wind of reality will blow and you will be back doing the same old stuff, not least because you've been exposed to all sorts of ideas and insights and cool stuff at this conference. So here's what I'd like you to do. If there was one thing you wanted to remember from this hour with me, what is it? And write that down for me, please. What's the one key takeaway that you really want to take away and remember this? Because it will help you actually stick. So write that down for me. insight, what's an action that you will take as a result of being in here for an hour with me? What's an action you'll take? It could be a really small thing like, I'm not going to file this card away, I'm going to stick it on my pin board or something so it doesn't get lost forever. It could be I'm just going to tell somebody about this. It could be that you might take one of these three actions that are up on the screen. Come and talk to us at the booth. We're running an open session where we do the whole of this workshop. We've got some, I think Gary, some limited space left on that. So if you're interested in that, come back and find us. And I run this, uh, this uh, group on LinkedIn called Tools for the Time Crunch Managers. So if you're interested in that, you can hook up with me on LinkedIn and we can join the group and there's lots of good tools and techniques there. Brilliant. Here's one last thing to do to finish this up. Unless anyone's got a burning question for me. Yes, please. Yes. Totally. You can totally use this. It, it, it's a little more rigorous when you've got somebody else because you can't self-sabotage so easily, but you could definitely use these questions and this process to guide yourself around here. Lovely. Here's my last request, okay? I'd like everybody to stand up, please, one final time. I've done my very best to make this a concentrated, useful, yet self-deprecatingly humorous hour, so that's great, but you know you've actually got some real benefit from the people you've been speaking with. So what I'd like you to do is catch the eye of the people you've had a chance to engage with in the room and give them a round of applause to say thank you for your work with me. <laughs> awesome. You can go home and saying, yes, I got a standing ovation at work today. Thank you very much. And I'll see some of you down at the booth. Lovely. Thanks for working with me. Great stuff. <laughs>